All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Boston Public School Superintendent Search Committee. I am co-chair Pam Edinger, and because this is a remote session, I will ask Ms. Sullivan to please call the roll. Thank you. Ms. Harvey? Present. Mr. O'Neill? Present. Dr. Pignano? Present. Mr. Roundtree? Ms. Tang? I'm so sorry. I have COVID. Um, oh, sorry. So I'm like sick and um, I'm going to be off camera a little bit. I was doing better. And then this afternoon, have, I think I did too much. And so I'm not as well again. <coughs> sorry. sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, Mr. Valenzuela. Present. Thank you. Dr. Edinger. Yes, I'm here. Ms. Lopera. Mr. McNeil. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Oh, thank you very much. Um, tonight's session is being shared live on Zoom, and it will be broadcast on Boston City TV and posted on the search committee's webpage, bostonpublicschools.org slash soup dash search. The committee is pleased to be offering live simultaneous interpretation in Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, Cabo Verdiano, Cantonese, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Somali, French, Arabic, and American Sign Language. After our interpreters finish introducing themselves and providing Zoom instructions, we will activate the interpretation icon or globe at the bottom of your screen. Click the icon to select your language preference. Now I will ask our Cantonese interpreter please to introduce herself and give Zoom instructions. Thank you, Co-Chair Dr. Edinger. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Anna. I'll be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting today. Like how I'm Anna, I'm like today. The Cantonese interpreter will be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting today. Like how I'm Anna, I'm like today. The Cantonese interpreter will be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting today. Like how I'm Anna, I'm like today. The Cantonese interpreter will be your Cantonese interpreter for the meeting today. Like how I'm Anna, I'm like today. Thank you very much. And will our Mandarin interpreter please introduce himself? Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Terry. I'll be a Mandarin interpreter. 大家好,我叫Terry,我是你们的国语翻译,待会儿您在屏幕下方会看到一个地球的图标,你点选地球的图标,然后再选择Mandarin,你就可以听到国语的频道了。如果你是用手机或者是平板电脑上的话呢,你
I'm sorry, I was on mute. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> okay. My name is Armando Monteiro. I'm going to be your okay, Verdian Creole interpreter tonight. Boa noite a todos. Minha nome é Armando Monteiro. A mim sabem ser nos interpreter de Creole Cabo Verdiano para hoje e noite. Para nos acessar nosso canal, nós também na parte inferior de nosso computador, nós só fazemos um clique sobre aquele pequeno globo e nós estamos com a nossa língua de preferência, que é a língua Creole Cabo Verdiano. Muito obrigado. Nós estamos hoje daqui a pouco. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. And now our Haitian Creole interpreter. Thank you, Dr. Edinger. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nadege, and I'll be your Haitian Creole interpreter. Bonsoir tout le monde. C'est un réel plaisir pour moi interpréter pour nous en Creole haïtien. Non, moi, c'est Nadege. Donc, moi, va apporter un bon service pour nous-mêmes. Si nous avons des questions, pas oublier, tapez les notes chat. Et puis, tout, faisait Creole um, haïtien pour Chanel. Merci and bon écoute. Back to you guys. Thank you very much. And now our Somali interpreter. Good evening. My name is Camilla. I'm going to be a Somali interpreter for tonight. Magaigawa Camilla, magkuso dawa da ao shirke no nasa da yamahan o lugu hula na yi mamula harusub e school ka. Marga wahadi ihili kertan kol ka Somali ka halka sa skadegi suno. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our French interpreter, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bartine. I'll be your, your French interpreter for tonight. And bonsoir tout le monde. Si vous voulez écouter la session en français, appuyez sur le globe en, en dessous de, de, de l'écran et choisir la langue en français. Merci. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our Arabic interpreter tonight, please. Thank you, Dr. Redinger. Hi, everyone. My name is Ahmed Rubai. I will be your Arabic interpreter today. مرحباً أنا اسمي أحمد الربيع أنا مترجم اللغة العربية لهذا اليوم بإمكانكم استماع إلى الترجمة باللغة العربية من خلال الذهاب إلى أسفل الشاشة ستشاهدون علامة الكرة الأرضية أضغط على هذه العلامة وستظهر لك اختيارات اللغات قم باختيار اللغة العربية وعندها استمر كامل الاستماع إلى الترجمة باللغة العربية كاملة شكراً جزيلاً Thank you Thank you very much Our American Sign Language Interpreters tonight are Kylie Kirkpatrick and Michelle Martinez, thank you. Oh, thank you to, for all, um, thank you all of you for assisting us this evening. And we will activate the interpretation icon at the bottom of your screen. I'd like to remember everyone and myself to speak at a slower pace to assist our interpreters. Thank you. Now we will um, move on to the approval of minutes. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our last meeting, April 19th, 2022, as presented. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you very much. Um, any discussion or objection? If not, Ms. Sullivan, can you please call the roll? Ms. Harvey? Yes. Mr. O'Neill? Yes. Dr. Pignato? Yes. Mr. Roundtree? Ms. Tang? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Valenzuela? Uh, I wasn't present last week, so I'll abstain. Thank you. Dr. Edinger? Yes. Ms. Lupera? Mr. McNeil? Yep. The minutes are approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we will now move to um, public comments. The committee has set aside up to 15 minutes of tonight's meeting. Uh, for public comments. Uh, I will turn it over to Ms. Sullivan to, to conduct our process. Thank you, Dr. Edinger. The public comment period for today's meeting will be 15 minutes in total. Each person will have two minutes to speak, and I will remind you when you have 30 seconds remaining. Those who require interpretation services will receive an additional two minutes. Please click the raise hand button if you wish to speak. I'll call on speakers in the order in which hands are raised. When I call your name, please state your name, affiliation, and what neighborhood you are from before you begin. Please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Do we have anyone this evening who wishes to speak? Dr. 
Dr. Edinger, I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, doctor, you're on mute. My apologies, I'm just going on and on. Um, thank you, Ms. Sullivan. I, then we will proceed to the next part of our meeting tonight. Um, as in every meeting, we offer for the record, um, the, an update of our search process. So bear with me uh, when I, as, I, as I read through this um, uh, for everybody's uh, information. Um, in terms of engagement, we have scheduled additional sessions, uh, several small stakeholder sessions, and these are hosted and led by the various stakeholder groups. Um, in addition, the search committee is partnering with the mayor's office to hold additional small group listening sessions in five other BPS home languages. And they, uh, they will be Haitian Creole, Cantonese, Cabo Verdiano Creole, um, Vietnamese, and, and Mandarin. Um, I do want to thank our search committee members for taking the time out of their schedule um, to participate in these additional listening sessions. We're also encouraging groups who wish to share feedback to host their own session and then send a summarizing memo to the search committee um, via official email that I have read off at the beginning of our session or invite search committee members um, who are available to attend um, and listen. So the other formats for engagement, um, you may send in video testimony and text submissions, um, and you can do that via the search webpage. And again, that um, location is bostonpublicschool.org slash soup search. Our email is superintendentsearch at bostonpublicschools.org. Um, regarding the use of feedback, the committee welcomes continuous feedback from the community. Uh, the feedback will help us shape the interview questions and elements for candidate selection. Furthermore, those, um, the feedback will also um, create a reservoir of information for us, uh, both for the, the school committee as well as the incoming superintendent um, in assisting um, future planning. Um, any questions on engagement or additions on engagement before we move on to the next part of our agenda? Okay. Again, I, I apologize. You really do have, if you wish to speak, please unmute and speak. Um, my, my, <laughs> my screen is not registering hands very well and I don't wanna miss anyone. Okay, we're good. All right, so the next part um, is um, survey results. I am delighted to welcome staff from the BPS Office of Data and Accountability who have been collecting and synthesizing the responses to the online survey. Now the survey closed on April 15th and um, tonight we're welcoming Senior Executive Director Monica, Monica Hogan and Director of Performance Management, Jake Stern. Um, do I see folks? Uh, oh, I see you. Okay, I see Jacob and Oh, there's Monica, welcome. Um, and they are joined by Jeff Lambert and Joey Headley from the city's analytics team who will assist with the analysis. Um, do I see Jeff and do I see Joey? Oh, there's Jeff. Let me see if I can find Joey here on my panel. Does everybody see Joey? Is it me who is not seeing Joey? Oh, there's Joseph, okay. Terrific. Um, so I will then um, turn this over to Jake. Jake, take me, the show's yours. Great. Thank, thank you, Dr. Edinger. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I'm Jake Stern. Good evening, everybody. All right. Um, so thank you for having us today. Um, we're delighted to speak to the committee. Um, I'm going to briefly run through um, the slides, um, and then I'll leave a fair amount of time for questions and answers from the committee. So um, feel free to catch me at the end, and as well as my colleagues from the city. Um, so a little bit about the survey. Um, it was it offered in 10 languages on the superintendent search website, as well as the city website. It was open for a little more than a month, and we had more than 500 responses from the BPS community and others. Um, a little bit about those respondents. Um, the majority of respondents were parents and guardians of BPS students. Um, however, we did allow folks to select more than one item. So just to note 
Um, if, for example, if somebody was a teacher as well as a parent, they could select both options. I'm looking at the race and ethnicity of respondents. Um, you can see that um, almost 50% of respondents self-identified as white. So that's much more than the BPS students, where only 14% of BPS students are white. Um, conversely, while 44% of our students are Latinx or Hispanic, only 14% of respondents were Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and 85% respondents did not answer the question. So I did want to put point out the kind of raw numbers on the side of the slide. So you get a sense of the fairly modest number of responses that are represented in this uh, data. Um, looking at the neighborhoods of respondents, um, you can see that um, neighborhoods such as Jamaica Plain, Roslindale, and West Roxbury um, were some, somewhat overrepresented, where more respondents, a greater percentage of respondents, were from those neighborhoods than our BPS um, students, um, where neighborhoods like Dorchester, East Boston, and Roxbury um, were not as highly represented as the BPS population. Looking at the language of respondents, um, as I noted, it was translated into 10 languages. However, almost 95% of responses were in English, and that's compared to about two thirds of our um, families preferred their communication in English. Um, the largest um, language group is Spanish speakers, where about 23% of families prefer communication in Spanish, but only 3.6% of our survey responses were in Spanish. All right, so let's get to the results. So in this slide, you can see the, the uh, 10 questions that were asked of respondents to um, rate from not important to very important. Um, these are the very important and important responses. You can see that almost for all questions, more than 85% of respondents rated these, these qualities as important or very important in terms of their characteristics for the next superintendent. Um, the dark blue are the very important responses, and the light blue are just important. Um, since there was such a you know, consensus that all of these qualities were either important or very important, um, we can distill it a little bit more by just looking at the very important responses only. So you see, we see a little bit more, um, we're able to distinguish a little bit more between the responses here. You can see that um, effective communication and demonstrated leadership and improving outcomes for all students were the, you know, 80, more than 80% of respondents indicated these were very important. Whereas on the, the right side of the slide, you can see that knowledge of the Boston and the BPS community, uh, a proven track record of um, engaging the school community and being visible and experiencing a large experience leading a large urban school district. Um, just more than 50% of the, the respondents indicated that those were very important qualities for the next superintendent. Um, we thought it'd be interesting to look at it based on if respondents indicated that they were interested or planned to attend a listening session, such as tonight. Let me see if we're seeing some different responses there or if they were not planning or were not sure if they were planning to attend a session. You can see there was a lot of agreement overall in terms of um, the same two are the highest, both, both uh, effective communication and demonstrated leadership, improving outcomes for all students were still the, the highest responses in terms of what was very important. Um, but there is some disparity um, where, where uh, more, more um, of the folks who chose to attend or plan to attend a session um, rated some of, the, some of the lower ones a little bit higher, such as knowledge of Boston, the BPS community, 58% of um, respondents who attended or planned to attend a listening session rated that very important, where 59% you know, of folks who did not plan to attend a session indicated that experience closing opportunity gaps for, for students' disabilities and ELs were very important. Another analysis we did was um, based on the race and ethnicity of respondents. And these questions are in the same order. Again, looking at very important only. 
Um, so you can see, again, there was some consensus that these top two furthest to the left um, questions were the, were the highest in terms of very important for, for the four largest racial groups. Um, Though there was some disparity, um, if you if you look left to right, where for example, only sixty percent of Asian respondents indicated that the, the ability to lead system wide change and enact new reforms was was very important, compared to eighty six of eighty six percent of Black and African American respondents. Remember, that's you know approximately forty responses for Asian families. So we do want to take all of this with a grain of salt. This is not necessarily um, representative of of any of these communities, but just giving a sense of what we see here. Um, and you can see some of the, there's some disparities here on the other side as well, where 73% of Asian respondents indicated that experience leading a large urban district was very important, which is um, quite a bit higher than some of, some of the Asian responses to a proven track record or experience closing opportunity gaps. So we also asked to um, before before you go on, we have a request from our interpreters to slow the pace because of the complexity of the numbers. So if we can just um, consider that there are folks trying to translate into a, a, a different language, I would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thank you for the reminder. I appreciate it. Um, and I'll try to be brief and feel free to ask any clarifying questions. Um, in addition to the um, prioritization of qualities in the next superintendent, um, we also asked two open response questions. Um, the first question was what other qualities or experiences are important to seek in the next superintendent? And our colleagues from um, City Hall did some um, analysis of these open response questions. Um, they ran a natural language processing algorithm to see which words in the responses grouped together or clustered together. And they were able to distill some um, cl key clusters from that. And I'll, I'll go through it briefly, but any follow-up questions, I'll leave for our, our colleagues from City Hall. So the major themes from that first question, um, the, the largest theme was school and community engagement, um, or 131 responses were clustered into that theme, um, followed by provision of quality education, 74 responses been under there, um, 57 responses in administrative collaboration, 52 in understanding of education system in Boston, and 10 in effective leadership. And just to, to give a little bit more color about um, what made up of each of those clusters, you can see these are some of the key words that were pulled out by the algorithm for each of those clusters. So for example, for the school community engagement cluster, there are words like support, families, commitment, and community. These are also some examples of responses in each cluster. I won't read them all, but they are they're quite um, colorful when you do go through them all. We also looked at the open response questions by, um, by broke out between white respondents and people of color. Um, you can see again, there's a lot of parity between the responses. You can see the majority of, of both people of color and, and white respondents were in the school and community engagement. Um, there, were, there were some differences, however. You can see that understanding of education system in Boston, more white responses were, were um, clustered in that, in that theme where fewer people of color. The second open response question was, what question would you most like a candidate for the job to answer? See, again, there was a strong cluster. The, the, the plurality of respondents um, had responses in the theme of supporting the needs of diverse learners, or 166 responses, um, where there were smaller clusters for addressing the school community needs, systemic reform, and providing equitable access to education. And, also looking at some of the keywords there when we think about what does it mean to be supporting the needs of diverse learners. 
We talked about things like special needs, staff, support, when we're talking about, for example, equitable access for education, responses included words like racial, resources, teachers, public. These are also some examples of some of the responses from each cluster. And, and obviously not all responses neatly clustered together. There were some differences um, across items. Um, so there were you know, it's a, it's a, um, it gives a general sense of, of the, the responses. It doesn't give you as much color as reading through each one. Again, breaking it out between white respondents and people of color. Um, you see it's fairly consistent overall. However, supporting the needs of diverse learners, a greater percentage of people of color had responses in that cluster than white people. Um, and conversely, for addressing school community needs, there were almost double the number of white responses in that category than people of color. So I'll stop there, um, but happy to answer any questions. And I'll definitely um, tag in some of my colleagues if there's anything. So do we, are we moving into- Marcus and, um, Mr. McNeil and Ms. Tang both have their hands up. Okay. Yeah, okay, so um, go ahead, Marcus. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think mine is more so of a, I think, observation than a question. Um, I did look at this before, um, and I am a little, I'm a little concerned about, I think, I think the lack of students that took this survey, um, and I think that, like, really struck out to me, um, only because we did have a um, listening session that was just dedicated to students, and I think that one went pretty well, um, but I am pretty concerned about, you know, just the amount of students that saw the survey, but I'm also trying to figure out, um, maybe you guys have the answer to this question, um, what could we have done differently to get students more access to this survey, um, maybe even creating a student survey, honestly, um, that has like very simple questions and what students really want to see. Because um, I think, again, conveying transparency to students is always important, especially in the search for the new superintendent. Um, so yeah, so that's just my observation. Um, but then like, you know, your advice as well of what we could have done differently to get this more out to students in um, BPS. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you, Marcus. And responses from our experts? or from other board members, I mean, other board members and other search committee members. One important piece of context is it's actually the survey season for us. Um, we're actually also surveying our students, teachers and families about their school climate and experience in their school. So just a, a, a shout out to all the, the families and teachers and students listening right now, go ahead and complete your climate survey as well, but that could lead to a little bit of survey fatigue um, if, if we're also asking for a lengthy survey on that. All right. Actually, Jacob will follow up on that and now I'm gonna to get to Jessica in a minute. When you say that there are other surveys going on on um, school cultures and, and, and so on, is that one survey or are the surveys broken up to, to various schools within the district? And how are they, how is that data aggregated? Yeah, so I'm uh, happy to go into this as well. Um, so we, we do have one survey for the entire district. Um, we ask questions about uh, you know, student learning experience as well as climate and culture of, of schools. And we're able to disaggregate that by um, different demographic groups. Um, and we have a different survey for teachers as well as for families. Yeah, because I, I'm thinking that um, if that information is available during the course of our search activities, um, I, I would love to, to have that be available to our um, search committee members and uh, 
in a maybe brief, meaningful way that will supplement what we're seeing here tonight. And, and that might be interesting for folks to see. Um, I don't mean to create like whole buckets of work for folks, but it seems like if you're um, surveying culture, um, it would answer part of Marcus's question, right? That, that there is supplemental information out there that would touch um, student input. So Mar Marcus, maybe we can chat about that um, offline a little bit and, and, and see if that can become um, a source of good information for us to supplement. Um, Jessica? Thanks. Um, I have a lot of questions, actually. <coughs> um, I, I, like Marcus, am a little disappointed in the responses. I mean, um, you know, the community BPS is in the tens of thousands. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a pretty darn sample, small darn um, pretty darn small sample size, sorry. Um, and so I, I do appreciate the work on this and distilling the information. Um, but I also, if I, re if I remember correctly, I looked at this earlier this morning, um, I think 9% of the respondents were not even BPS members, <laughs> members of the BPS community. Um, and that seemed like a pretty large percent for a very small sample size. Uh, so I wondered if you had disaggregated the data at all um, out uh, to remove the um, uh, oh out oh it's much higher forty five percent. Referring to the outside of Boston, if you go to the next slide, Jake, the neighborhood slide, nine percent of respondents said outside of Boston. Okay, so that's where I got the nine percent from. Okay. Um, and so I didn't, I don't know if there was any thought to disaggregate that data. I just was curious about it, if that would change anything. Um, and then the other two questions I have is, um, <clears throat> um, what what is like the plan for, or, and maybe this is with JG or, um, uh, um, anyone else, you know, what, how, how does one suggest that this, these results inform the search? Um, and I also wonder if we add up the number of people who have attended the forums, um, you know, how many people that is, um, it just, um, I don't know. And then the third thing is, thing is you know, uh, looking at the questions and such, um, what, what information does this give us? And I'm kind of curious how these questions were, were created in first place. Um, and, you know, some of them are kind of vague, right? So like when say like, you know, changes for the need of reforms, I think it depends on what the reforms are, right? That, that the person would be um, trying to move forward. And so some of these questions were kind of hard to, hard, uh, to answer. And I was just curious how, the questions were come up with and um, how the survey was created in first place too. So that was a lot of questions. I know, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with this information. And um, I think it's always an important question of the survey is how do you use the information and do the questions then get to uh, the use that you have uh, for it in first place. Sure, and I can take a stab. Um, tell me if I'm missing any questions. Um, and I think Mary pointed out in the chat, I think rightly that, you know, many BPS teachers are, are not necessarily living in the city of Boston. So, you know, there are a number of folks who have um, stakeholders in the BPS community who do not necessarily live in Boston. Um, and it was, you know, open to all respondents. Um, Respectfully, though, I think it was 25% were not, were, were community, not people who are in the um, BPS stakeholder mm -hmm. so that still doesn't quite make sense but yeah, anyway it was open all you know all city of boston or even outside of boston could, could right, right right i understand that but um but nine percent was uh versus the 25 percent. anyway it doesn't matter go ahead well i can yeah let's not go too too much into that i guess yeah um but speaking of the the kind of the how to use results question i think that's a really important um context to think about. And I really appreciated the folks who even in their questions were really noting the small sample size. We really want to underline that as well. And we're thinking about how we're responsibly using this data. Um, 
it is one data point, and I think it's. I think we would all agree that it's important to kind of triangulate this data with other sources of data, whether that's from listening sessions, your own professional experience, working with superintendents, hiring superintendents. So we, we really would underline that this is not a representative sample. We tried to make that point, and that this is for kind of informational purposes that you can use um, to, to kind of further flesh out some of your other sources of information. Um, the, the questions were consistent and, and um, edited from questions we've asked in previous superintendent searches. Um, they were based on priorities um, identified you know, by the district to, to, for folks to give feedback on um, and were Likert scale questions in, in order to get um, reliable responses. Um, am, I missing, am I missing a question? No, I, uh, I think that's fine. We can move on. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Roxy? Thank you. Um, my first part of the question, just because, um, well, first I'll start with a comment for Mr. Stern, um, because clearly, you know, the point of it being that, you know, the low numbers and things like that, I think it's, as I'm looking at it, I, to be honest, it just seems disappointing because I'm thinking this of like, yes, it's not the only data point you're accurate in that. There's there is the listening sessions, the 15 minutes here, um, but it's a point that allowed more access, right? In languages, in reach and things like that. So that's why I consider it an important point. Um, and when I think of, let's say there are, you know, let's call it 48,000, 49,000 students, whatever the current number is. Um, and then you add in our teachers, our school leaders, our central office staff. Um, and then I say employees to that include the people who transport our children. Then when I think of 500 or whatever this number was, I forget what it, it was 500 and something, then compared to their community, it is extremely low. And I'm wondering, at what point during this five weeks that the surveys were open? Was there a point that it was considered as you were seeing, and when I say you, I don't mean you specifically, but the team, as, they're, as you're seeing the survey responses and it's at 100, 200, 300, and you're approaching, even closing, do you start to reflect beyond, oh, we've sent out other surveys, so it's probably survey fatigue, so it is what it is, that's all we're going to take it. Do you get to a point where you say, hey, it's been open two weeks, we have about 500, it's looking lower 300, um, we need to change a strategy to try to push this survey in a different way that might engage um, members more so, and I almost use the word community members, but then on slide 10, I was going to ask you, who are the community members? Like, I'm trying to remember how that was defined that would make someone say community member because BPS student is already identified, family, teachers, school leaders, et cetera. That's all. It, but, so, are community members Boston residents or community members anyone that is literally in Massachusetts that felt like anyone anywhere that felt like filling out the survey? How was that? Was there a definition of like community members meaning blank? Or was that just one of those things like I feel lost? I, I feel like I live in New England and Boston's part of one of the communities, so I'm a community member. Yeah, so I can speak to your first point first. Um, the we shared the updated responses and results from the survey with, with the chairs of this committee multiple times throughout the process. We are not the um, communications and, and marketing of the survey. We're just the administration and, and data analysis piece, you know, happy to, you know, take responses from anybody. Um, the community, the, the, and I'll just share my screen for one more second. The response, the options here were the options that were provided in the survey itself. So I would imagine the that wrong many, screen. That's email. Sorry, show my email. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. Um, sorry, the responses you can see here are not are not 
uh, our, our representative of the responses were given in the survey. So if someone identified as a community member, that was you know self identification. We we did not put any further um, definitions or or um, criteria for what what that means. I mean, would it be fair to say that if you didn't belong to the first five categories, that you're not a student, you're not a parent or guardian of a student, you're not teaching, you're not a school leader, or if you're not working BPS, you're a community member, meaning you have no direct connection in that way to the BPS enterprise, right? Yet you want to fill out the survey. So it could be someone living in Boston, living outside of Boston, um, because we didn't define community. So, so if we're looking at purely stakeholders who are connected to BPS, it is the 75% we see in the first five bars. Is that, is that a reasonable assumption? Roxy, is that this, how does that resonate with what you just asked? So that is logical if you want, because you, those other groups are obviously, are obviously BPS affiliated based on it, literally what they are. Right. I guess I was looking to see, because I know we also have partner, community partner organizations. Right. And I wasn't sure if maybe the partner organizations or, had said, like, you know, because we work with BPS students and BPS, they filled it out on that level. Um, I was just trying to think, yeah. then I would also look at data a little bit differently. I take that 25%, which is a mesh. And I, you know, because I want to also know, honestly, the heart of the community which is those who are working, living and caring for, because even the numbers don't match up for when you say, well, th then the ones that don't live in Boston have to be all teachers because there's no residency. I understand there's no residency to requirement to live in Boston to be a teacher. Right. But the numbers still don't make sense that, that, is tw that those are the individuals who don't live in Boston to me. So I'm, I was just trying to figure out, to get an idea of who's given the feedback, yeah. right? Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes when messages and communication to hear just in the sense of when you hear a community or people come out and speak about something, mm. the reason you ask a, a, perhaps that school committee for the neighborhood affiliation is to see you know, the proximity and how it's impacting, right? Yeah. So for this, I look, I'm looking for that also really when I'm looking at it. So the numbers are already low. And even with these low numbers, a lot of it is external to some degree. They might be partner organizations, but I don't know. They right. might be individuals who live in who are committed to Boston public schools because so they live in the city of Boston. Right. But That's once great. again, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and these are comments that are not defined at all. It's more of like, as I'm thinking of like, if this was if this was if we had a dual board, there were more opportunities. I'd be looking like even when he, um, he said that you know the chairs got got weekly feedback of how many people filling out the surveys per se. I mean. Like I, I didn't hear we can see back a lot how many people are filling it out because I think there are points in times when it's that low, you push back to your communities and all of ours, you know, earlier today, Dr. Pignato was in her school leaders um, community for the listening session with SPEDPAC, one had one CPC and all these other organizations that are BPS affiliated are having one. So I think if we were hearing that, oh, 50 people have only filled it out or hundred, you know, then it's like, well, let's see if we can galvanize even more so because we're not getting responses. Oh, the students aren't responding. On DLAC, you know, it looks like certain language people who primary communication mode is these languages aren't responding. I just think of it as also a learning point because if I'm given information that says, we'll take it with a grain of salt because it's so low, it's so low um, feedback. That wasn't the goal of it though, right? I didn't want to get information to take with a grain of salt. I wanted real information to be able to, be able to see what people were thinking, how they're feeling. They haven't been able to, maybe didn't come to the listening sessions, could not for various reasons. And sending emails don't always work for everyone. Some people need time to process, to think, and just do it slowly. So that's why I make those comments. Just that I see an opportunity because I think your your window is was nice, right? A month that was solid. Um, so I look at languages, ten languages. Once again, I'm like, okay, that's great. So it had portions that were poised for success of more feedback. Um, and I'm trying to figure out and just saying I guess what I'm saying too is also just saying oh well we're sending out other surveys climate surveys so that might be the reason I don't think that as a parent because I got two surveys doesn't mean I'm only filling out 50 percent one you know what I mean so I I wonder if it's more than that yeah I it, it is it's certainly I think 
Roxy points to the difficulty of community engagement in everything that we do within the district, right? Because I know that school leaders struggles with that and it's one of their um, biggest resource, yet it's the hardest to, to tap into. Um, let me, let me so, so let's hold those thoughts, Roxy, that you have and see if there are things that we can do when we go to the next, as we move on to the next phase to ensure that we pay some attention, right, to, um, other surveys that have been done or the culture surveys that touches every school, uh, maybe that can give us a source of triangulation as well. I, I, I hear your concern. I hear your concern that 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 the voices we're not hearing um, are the ones that we should also pay attention to as well as the one that is being documented. So let me, um, I need to know which hands are old hands, which ones are new hands. So, so Carlene, yours are new, right? And Jessica, do you mean to come back around? So that's a new hand too, right? Um, it is, but honestly, okay. if we have other things to cover, we can, I, I don't wanna. Right, uh, so we've devoted actually um, the, the, the entire session and we've got a, a good 10, 15 more minutes. Um, so so let's, let's, let's hear um, what Dr. Pignato has to say and, um, and, and come back around to you. Um, and then we can, we can go on from there, all right? So Carly, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. I'd like to, to go back to Mr. Marcus McNeil's point. Um, I am also surprised that we had so few students respond to the survey. After all, we're doing this in service of students. Um, so I am wondering, and perhaps Mr. Roundtree, you might offer some suggestions here. Um, it's one thing to complete a survey a panorama survey at the school level. And it's another thing for students to feel like they are completing a survey and sharing their voices about a superintendent that they, they will feel like they have contributed to, right? Um, so is there an opportunity to push the survey into schools and give students a chance to complete the survey so that we can hear more of their voices. Um, and the second part is, since we have additional listening sessions, could we possibly give people an opportunity to complete the survey during the session uh, so that we can have as many responses as possible? And the third is, do we have to close the survey? Like, is there a hard reason that we couldn't leave it open to get more people to respond? I know I asked three things. I, I don't have answers to any of those. <laughs> but one of the things that I would like to suggest though, is that we put a punctuation mark on this portion of the survey, right? So whatever comes in, we can consider if we do end up opening again. Um, so that so that so so that we don't mix the 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 subsequent phases to see how, you know how much more um, we can get in. Maybe it really should be targeted to students um, rather than um, trying to get more results in the same venue because we've had that same venue open for you know a number of weeks and the likelihood of people coming back to um, to do it again or push other people to do it again would not would not be a high possibility. Um, so Joseph uh, said, I think it's important to note that surveys are self-selecting, um, which is true that the respondents um, who feel inclined to share will share. Um, and, 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 and I would agree that it's not always the top of their priorities, but I think making a way for an additional venue for the students um, whom this particular process impacts so much uh, might be a portion that we can consider. We don't have to have a, an answer tonight. Uh, we can, you know, we can, we can see what we can do about targeting that. So, so I, I would ask um, the committee hold that thought and, and see what we can do and we can come back and, and, and see if we can um, focus on that particular piece. Um, all right. So, um, Thank you, Dr. Pignetto. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> I don't have answers for you other two questions, but I think it definitely is something that you know we need to consider. Um, uh, I think who's him? Uh, do you do you want a second go at this, Jessica? Any uh, idea? Yeah, I mean, you know, hearing what was just shared, 
uh, I'll just share that. Um, I think we need to go back to what is the purpose of the survey and how mm -hmm. is this information supposed to inform our search? And so, you know, uh, it, it, and if we have, um, if we're trying to get more meaningful feedback, particularly mm -hmm. from specific groups like uh, students, um, parents or educators, et cetera, or looking at, you know, where we are not hearing enough from um, uh, certain uh, demographics of our BPS community, or for example, Spanish speakers, um, then I think we could do targeted outreach, but to get feedback in a more meaningful way, for example, um, narrowing down maybe the survey or the, um, or having a second kind of survey or follow-up um, focus groups, et cetera, um, to get more meaningful information from the areas where we think we might be having gaps, uh, but to narrow it down based on the current data we already have so it's not so general and vague yeah. Yeah. Um, is, a, is it maybe a suggestion. Uh, okay. so, and, and I'm glad that we're doing the follow-up um, listening sessions because at a certain point, I do think we've started to hear the same themes Yes. Um, over and over again, uh, which to me suggests that we maybe at some point with our focus groups and listening sessions have gotten some critical mass of um, just statistically significant responses. Um, but that might be another way to get more information. But I do, again, I don't want to lose sight of, you know, if, if this survey um, isn't helpful in terms of uh, beyond the data that it's already presented to us, um, as a data point, then I wouldn't want to spend a significant amount of time and energy trying to get more people to fill out this specific survey necessarily. If right. that makes sense. Thank, thank you for that perspective. It, it, you know, what struck me as I was looking at all the slides is that there are two slides um, that jumped out at me, you know, regardless, not regardless, but even in view of the fact that, that yeah, the survey has, has a um, geographic skew to it. Um, and even with a 25% community that we're not quite sure if they are stakeholders in, in, in the non-BPS connected way um, or, or where these folks live, the two pieces that popped out as very important, the communications piece and the proven record of outcomes piece really jumped out um, um, in a very apparent way. And then when we disaggregated for race ethnicity, those two of the same things jumped out again. What I see is not so much that the survey is going to give us all the answers that we're looking for. If that's the case, the nine of us don't need to be here. Right? We know, we know, we know what the answers are. But what I think it does is that it helps to validate some of the things that we're hearing as we're going through this very, very long process of listening um, to over a thousand people in multiple groups. Um, I, I frankly don't think that we're going to get substantially different answers. Um, if the profiles of the folks who are going to come in as a second week to fill out these surveys um, are not focused, as Jessica had noted. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to get what we got um, in some ways because it does validate for me. Um, it validated the need for communications. It validated the need for um, proven records of student learning, I mean, student outcomes as being two of the top pieces. And it also validated for me in the two open questions um, the importance of school and community engagement in question number one, and also the needs of diverse learners in question number two. So those four points jumped out at me as being anchoring information um, that, that, that the survey is offering that tucks into some of the points that came out of the, um, the listening sessions. Um, so I didn't hear a great deal from other folks around the table. Uh, Mr. O'Neill, Mr. Roundtree, and it's Mr. Valenzuela, um, thoughts on this? Yeah, I can, I can go. Um, I lowered my hand because Jessica said exactly what I was gonna say was, um, I think really we wanna think about the purpose of the survey and the purpose mm -hmm. as I've understood it. And I think as we've communicated was to inform um, in, in many ways was to inform um, the adjustments to the job description, which has been completed. I think if we want to um, solicit additional feedback, I think we should be very um, clear about the why, right? And so if, if the job description is, is, um, is complete and now we're looking at candidates coming in, if we want more feedback from people, I think it should be aligned to what we're currently doing in the process, right? We should be 
um, very uh, clear and, and deliberate about that. Um, and the other thing I think, um, you know, I also agree with Jessica that we've we've heard a lot of consistency, right, through our listening sessions, you know, and I, and I, and I saw a line between what we've heard and what we saw. So kind of thinking about like, what is the, you know, the, the utility of, um, of the survey, but also I think if we really want to hear more from kids, I think, you know, I was a teacher for a long time and a principal for a long time. And I think that if we're doing listening sessions or if we're going to a survey, having them fill out a survey to some degree, we are asking them to come to us. And I think with kids, you, we have to go to them. Right. I think that the, you know, the, um, a, a, a way, something we may consider would be to either enlist BSAC's help, um, Boston Student Advisory Council, fantastic bunch of kids. Um, we met with them um, last week about some of the grading policy stuff um, to get them to advocate um, in their communities for more students to participate, or also just maybe go to a couple schools and, you know, yeah. and camp out, right, and set up a table, maybe put out some donuts and get kids to talk to us. Okay, thank you. That that that's very helpful, Jean. So so we will put that in our in our in our bag of tools and and see which one we can uh, we can leverage as as we go on. Um, Jose, we hadn't heard from you. How are you? How are you feeling about all this? Uh, I don't I, I don't know if I have anything additional to that, but I agree about um, bringing it to students. If we do, in fact, deem it's important to have students complete the survey, which um, I think it might be fruitful. Um, I can just say from experience, there's a lot of times where we do actually pause our school day so that students can complete surveys during during um, uh, during class time. And so, I mean, it's certainly doable. We do it during the year. Panorama is a good example of when we do it. Um, and I think it's important enough that um, if we did do it, I think um, teachers and students would understand why we were taking time out of the day to, to do it. And I think there's value in that. So um, I think that's the only other piece I would add, but okay. agree with a lot of the points that were made just now. Okay. So thank you, Jose. Uh, Michael, I think, I think you're the last of our um, search committee members who have not spoken. Thank you. I think this conversation has been great. I've really enjoyed the feedback of uh, the fellow members, how they've heard it, interpreted, asked questions about it. I consider the survey to be one piece of the puzzle, right? It's like a jigsaw puzzle we're putting together. So the um, listening sessions we've all attended, uh, whether they're the big general ones, the ones in other languages, um, now more specialty groups that are happening, such as the school leader ones that a number of us have attended today. The student one I thought was very uh, indicative. It was actually one of the most engaged ones we had, right? Where the students from all different ages, I expected it to be predominantly high school, but it was all different age students coming with thoughts. So I, I look at, I, I see this as a mosaic. I take pieces from each and see, am I seeing overlapping themes? Because this not only informed the job description, but it will inform how we approach reviewing applications, how we approach interviewing candidates, um, because it's when, when we see a general theme that emerges across multiple points of contact to us, that reinforces to me and, and impacts how I approach this work. So I point out one thing in particular, in previous searches, we have often heard it is most important that someone be a sitting superintendent. We didn't hear that as much this time in listening sessions and even in this survey, we heard the value of an educator, that they have been a classroom teacher, that they be a school leader, some district administration helps and, it's, and it would be great to get a superintendent. But even one of the slides we saw today where 85%, I think it said most important was that they're an educator and 51% said sitting superintendent. That is consistent what we, we have heard in listening sessions. So that's how I'm approaching this and is how do I see these pieces fitting together? And if we're hearing themes emerge over and over again, that becomes really important to me and, and impacts how I approach this work. So okay. I appreciate the questions about this survey are standalone and it is important for us to dig in and understand it. But to me, it's a piece of the puzzle overall. Right. And and you know, I that resonates with me, uh, Michael, and and in some ways. There is no silver bullet of public opinion gathering. <laughs> I think the way that we've been doing it in all of these different venues and all of these different iterations, um, 
it, it leaves me the realization is that it is the nine of us who needs to do the hard work. It is our assembly work to do versus any one instrument is going to give us the answer. Um, I, I still believe that we, 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 we will likely want to gather more student voices um, because they are the one who's going to be living with this, right? Um, but, um, and I also agree though, the fact that we need to figure out what exactly we're going to use these more student, you know, these student voices for in terms of, of context of what Jean said, what is the purpose um, of us wanting more pieces? So um, what, what I ask is that we, you know, we, 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 we don't make any decisions tonight, but let's, let's take it offline and, 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 and think about some possible um, follow-ups to this but we take this um, valuable information and the instrument that's been created um, for the purpose that it served. And I, I really want to thank our experts, um, our, our researchers and analysts um, who have compiled this for us. Um, and not only need to show us uh, the pieces that we need to see that's gonna inform us, but to show us what we're not seeing, right? So, so knowing what is not there is, is as important as, um, as what we have at the table. We are getting to, um, uh, the hour. Uh, we, we are actually four minutes over, but this is such a terrific discussion. Um, I want to say a little bit as we conclude this and, and thank our um, experts. I want to say a little bit about next week. Um, so we will go think about this issue and maybe come up with some suggestions and, and bring it back so that we can get to the next piece of this action. Um, but next week is also the beginning of our, oh, Jessica, feel better. Um, I, I, I know you're going to be leaving us in a minute. Um, so next week, I've, I've asked our um, uh, JG consultant folks uh, to, to, do some, um, to do some training with us in terms of the protocol that all of us need to hew to as a group as we go through the next phase, um, the do's and don'ts, the, the best practices out in the field, um, and and and... And, and they're going to try to compile uh, some of that training for us, but also to begin to discuss um, the questions themselves. Uh, so what we will do in terms of format is that we will um, convene an open session um, to give whatever update that we need to give uh, to, um, to the public and to allow for the usual amount of time um, or maybe abridged, I mean, that we had no open comments today. So we will reconsider the 15 minutes um, to see if that's too long so that we can maybe maybe do a 10 minute and we'll consult with that to make sure that um, we're not shorting the public's time, but we will do an opening, do an update and then do a public comments. And then we will, um, um, we will um, retire to an executive session um, so that we can discuss questions um, in, 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 in that venue. And we will not reconvene um, to, openings, to, to open session afterwards. We will dismiss from executive session. Uh, so please expect that next week. Um, and uh, James, James and I, I think with maybe some of our co-chairs, um, we'll likely have um, a phone call um, to um, formalize what we're gonna to see together next week in terms of protocol. So you have a sense of the tools that we're gonna have going forward. Any questions on that? Okay, so um, thank you, Roxy, for that comment um, in, 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 in chat. And we will hang on to that and use that to inform uh, the discussion of what to do next. Um, okay, so if there are no other questions, um, I will entertain a motion to, um, um, adjourn and go have dinner. May I have a may I have a motion for dinner, please? Nobody wants so to leave. Oh, so there much. you go, Jean. Thank you very much. May I have a second? I, I do need a second. Come on, folks. Second. Thank you. Um, if there if there um, if there are no um, objections, Liz, can you please do a roll call? Ms. Harvey. Yes. Mr. O'Neill. Yes. Dr. Pignato? Yes. Mr. Roundtree? Yes. Ms. Tang? Mr. Valenzuela? Yes. Dr. Edinger? Yes. Ms. Lopera? Mr. Mr. McNeil? Thank you. We're adjourned. Yeah, thank you very much. And I'll see everybody next week. Okay, thank you so much. <laughs>